my true pleasure to introduce one of my best friends of all time, who is also one of what I consider the best children's authors of all time. She has just authored a book called A Thousand Minutes to Sunlight, published by Beck Macmillan. And this is her second book. Her debut book was so well received that it, it went on to the uh, school, what do you call the school book tours? They went traveling oh. around, what was it, Jen? Yes, um, it was really cool. It got sold to Scholastic. And if you Scholastic. were a child, you know, in any, the last 30 years, you know, the book fairs that come to the yeah. school. So it got made into a book fair book, which was really cool. So it got to make the rounds there. Congratulations. Yes. yes. So Jen, I'm so happy you're here. Thank you so much to all of our viewers. A Thousand Minutes to Sunlight's brand new. And my friend and author, uh, Jen White is the author, and she's here to talk to us about writing, about great children's books, about her Instagram, where she talks about great children's books, about publishing, and also about the contents of this book, and a little bit about mental illness and anxiety in children. So all good things. She's a mom of five, and she's used a lot of her experiences as a mother to inform this book, which is apropos given this is our Mother's Day uh, meet. So, oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, Jen, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Tell me a little bit about how you thought about creating this book originally. Um, well, I started writing this book actually about four years ago. So it was a while ago. And uh, when I was writing it, I was in the thick of, uh, as you said, I have five kids. So I was in the thick of that with lots of um, you know, high school, middle school, elementary school. I even at one point, you know, that we had the preschool in there. So we had every age child. And um, I could see in my kids and other kids that my children were friends with that there seemed to be a lot of anxiety out there, mm -hmm. um, a lot of worry. And um, I did some school visits. I used to go around and visit schools with my first book, survival strategies of the almost brave. And um, I remember I had a conversation with the teacher there and I told him, I think I'm going to write this book. Um, maybe a, a character that has anxiety. And he said, Oh my goodness, I can't tell you one child in my class that doesn't have some sort of issue with that. And I was actually surprised to hear that. And so he said, I just, I think it's timely and it's needed. Um, so I just, it was just kind of an idea rolling around in my head and I'm not an author that plots my books. So I don't have an idea and then write, you know, do the book from beginning to end. And a lot of authors do that. And that's a great way to write a book, but I usually start with a character. Mm -hmm. So I had been thinking about this book and then pretty soon I could hear, as soon as I can kind of hear that character's voice in my head, I know I'm ready to write. And so I, started writing her. Mm -hmm. So it was really fun. And the main really character is cool. Cora. Yeah. Well, I love your focus that you have on characters. And, you know, I'm about, I'm about a third of the way through your book right now. And it's super engaging and it's a lot of fun. And there's this character that's like her, it's brain, right? And this is yeah. the, this is brain talking to her, which is another part of her. So can you tell me a little bit about the interplay between her and quote unquote brain and like, how does that relate to anxiety in kids? Um, so I think, you know, when I started writing Cora at first, I just had this really anxious child and I was kind of thinking of the kid. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this where you meet someone or you meet a child who is so shy that it almost paralyzes them and they immediately turn bright red. If you look in their direction or talk to them, they are frozen in that moment. And it's very painful for them to like speak to you or interact in any way. So I was imagining her like this. And what was fun is pretty soon I just started getting these thoughts. And I think we all have this, this running dialogue in our own brains, uh, judging and assessing everything. And those judgments can be true or not true. And a lot of times you have anxiety or any other fear that can speak to you and, and it doesn't necessarily mean you should listen to it. And so I kind of had brain as an unreliable character because you didn't know if he was 
telling you the truth? Is he telling you the truth? And he started out just to be kind of this snarky, funny guy. Like if you have a friend where you can sit together and be really judgmental and critical of like everyone around you and be kind of wicked about it. And, and if, and my husband was funny, he's like, if you don't, can't think of a friend like that, that means you are the friend like that. <laughs> and I was like, that's kind of true. So um, that's kind of how brain was. And in the beginning, he seems pretty harmless, you know, just kind of snarky and funny and a little negative. But as the book progresses, you can see that it's taking a darker turn as it progresses. Mm-hmm. That, that is, I think that's such an interesting and pretty unique way to do it in a way that makes it kind of safe for kids to explore those themes while they're reading it. That was another thing I thought was really cool about the book. But um, Lauren, I don't know about you, but I feel that way all the time. I feel like I've got brain in my head saying unre- being an unreliable source of information. Yeah. As you're talking, I'm thinking, we, don't we all struggle with the heart brain conundrum all our lives is where yeah. do you listen? You know, which part of you do you listen to? You know, your heart is right 99% of the time, but your brain is so loud and really overpowering and makes a very, very solid argument for following bad advice. I think that's, that's true all the time. Yeah. So he was actually pretty fun to write, but I have noticed like some people as they're reading, he gets to them, he gets annoying. Like that character becomes an annoyance. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of glad because he is supposed to be like that. I mean, she thinks he's her friend, but he's not. He's the villain in the end. Interesting that so interesting you say that because as I was reading, I started like feeling like a little bit like, uh, please quit talking brain. You know, (laughs) he's creating anxiety for a story. And yeah. so that's really interesting that was deliberate. Well, it was interesting because my editor, we did talk about that. And she said, you know, I think in the middle, I pulled some brain stuff because we didn't want it to be so annoying that you would quit reading the book. Right. Mm-hmm. But we did want it to be clear. Like you, you want to like champion Cora and be like, don't listen to him. Just, you know, ignore him. And, you know, eventually we hopefully get to that place. Right. So Jen, what age is the book folk is it targeted to? So it's listed as eight years old and up. I have a nine-year-old. I don't know if I would give it to her yet. Maybe I'm thinking around 10. Do you think, I mean, you have a 10-year-old. Um, yeah. You know, our, our girls are best friends. So we, we yeah. <laughs> Haley and Lola are our youngest kids and they're besties. And so yeah. Haley's 10 and she's probably, oh, she, I think she's, she probably needs another year before. Yeah. I would say sixth grade. I would feel very confident handing this to 11 or a 12 year old. Mm -hmm. I think, And and then if you like children's literature, you like a good story. I think every age can enjoy it. And I think there's, um, I don't think, you know, it's interesting four years ago when I started writing it, I had no idea it would be coming out in the time of COVID, the pandemic, a lot of, um, social unrest. There's a lot of, you know, economic instability. There's a lot of things to be worried about in the world right now. A lot of legitimate sources of anxiety. Right. And so I think it's a very important conversation to talk about our mental health and talk about our brains. What's going on up here? Where did the title come from? Well, um, it actually came from my editor's assistant. We were kind of talking about, you know, how time plays a very important role in the book. It's almost like another character. And so we were talking about how she's always counting the minutes. And I, so we were talking about the the title and I was kind of hesitant to have the word sunlight in it because there is a character in the book called Sunshine. And I didn't necessarily want it to reference that. But the more we talked about it, um, it's kind of a collaboration that was a long way of saying it's a collaboration of all of us. So I can't take credit for that amazing title. It is an amazing title. So tell us, tell us a little bit more about, you know, you have this Instagram channel also where you talk about books. Tell me, how did that get started? And, and why did you choose? Why are you choosing the books that you're choosing? Do you have any like guidelines? Here? Well, I think, you know, I've had an Instagram account for my author, you know, presence online. 
And it's been interesting, but I, I actually really love to talk about kids' books. I read a lot of kids' books. Um, I got my uh, master's degree in writing for children and young adults. So I have read a ton. And if I could just like sit and talk to someone, that's probably what I would choose to talk about. So I just decided, well, I don't know if anybody's going to listen, but I'm just going to talk about the books that I love and why I like them and talk about writers and, um, you know, a lot of some of the classes that I had in college. And it's just uh, kind of my favorite thing to do is talk about books. So, uh, I hope some people will get something good out of it. Well, as we see behind you, <laughs> you're obviously a great lover of books. Yes. I am. Here they are. <laughs> I love it. Well, one other topic that I wanted to broach was there was a, a recent survey that came out saying that like in all levels of business, and this is just, this is a business angle. This is not even a consumer level. But in all levels of business, from the boss all the way down to, you know, the entry level worker, people are 40% less mentally healthy than they were before COVID started, which, and I've seen it in my own um, organization that I work in, you know, we've had a couple of people really kind of like really, really struggle with some mental health issues. And I've seen my own children become like a little listless in front of the zoom schools and you know you see and then um, I work with some people in India and this morning I was on with them and they said that the depression because of you know everything was opening and now it is because of what's the horrible things happening with COVID in India right now everything shut down again and that the, the depression is deep because now they know what lockdown is going to mean and they I... were in for a while and so what would you suggest just with all of your research with anxiety and with the five children that you currently have, what would you recommend in terms of um, coping strategies for anxiety, either for our children or for ourselves? Well, obviously I'm not a doctor, so, but I can, I mean, I can just tell you about from my research and I did have a child psychologist read this book before we sent it out just because I wanted to get it as right as I possibly could. Um, I think the first thing, I think sometimes, with especially younger children, we are kind of afraid to talk about the hard things that are happening. Or um, if we notice that they're feeling a little sad or listless, like we don't really want to bring it up or draw attention to it because we're afraid it'll make it worse. And that's actually 100% not true. So if you see anyone in your family who seems to be struggling, it's definitely a good idea to bring it up and talk about it because you can't solve it. You can't solve something that you're not, you haven't acknowledged. So I think that's the first thing. And then I think, um, you know what, therapy is a great place to start. You know, you can see from there if it's a serious, it's a more serious issue where maybe you need medicine and go see a psychiatrist or your doctor. But I think uh, therapy is a good place to start. And, you know, that's a whole other discussion because therapy can be expensive. And if you don't have insurance, it can be really uh, difficult. But our school systems actually have therapists that are right in the school with the kids. And so it would be a good place to reach out there. And there's a lot of um, ways that you can get therapy that it's not, you know, $250 every time you go. So there's things in the community that you can reach out for. But I saw, I saw this thing on Instagram and I wish that we would do something like this. I think it was a train station in Brazil and they have all these kiosks with professional educated therapists and you can walk up and get therapy for free just to wow. know. What a great, like, yeah. wouldn't that be a good social construct to invest our time and money in. I mean, I think it would really be. Well, helpful. it would certainly help to take away the stigma. Yes. That's so awesome. I think the first thing is to start talking about it and having a conversation and then, you know, then you can address what you need to. That's a good reminder for me because I have a tendency to shut down emotion a little bit. Like if, like if my kids are thrown in a tantrum, my initial reaction is not to be like, what's wrong? It's like, stop, you know, stop being dramatic or whatever, you know? Yeah. And, and I think I've been told by my adult children now that, that uh, I should not do that for the younger children. 
So I know. It's, always, we were, it's always good to come back, you know. I feel like I was raised in the era of like, if you're throwing a tantrum, please leave the room and don't come back until you can be happy. Yeah. And that's not necessarily the best way to deal with it. Approach it. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, it's such an interesting conversation and I appreciate you so much for getting the conversation really started. And again, like destigmatizing anxiety in children because we're having it more than ever. So that was a great point, Lauren. Well, that's my goal is if I can just get families and people to just start talking about it and not be afraid to talk about it, maybe with their peers or their friends. And like you said, destigmatizing it and making it not such a scary or a bad thing. Yeah, even that. just learning to ask the simple question of how can I help you make this better? Right. Just Absolutely. Be willing to have a conversation. That's totally. right. And also for all of our viewers, this is a really fabulous like treasure hunt book too. So it's not like we're, it's not heavy. It's, it's not a fun. totally depressing book. I promise you. <laughs> no, it's, it, it has those themes in there that are really helpful, but it's just wrapped in this very sunshiny package and it's a lot of fun and it's a really good, easy read. So, you know, whether you're eight or you're 80, I think it's something that everyone will enjoy. I hope so. Well, Jen, thank you so much for your time. And it has just been such a pleasure to talk with you about your new book and congr congratulations on all of your success. Thank you. Just keep writing. We love bringing you back with new brilliance. Thank it's you. so fun to see you again. Thank you for having me. And we'll be right back.